the Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. The Financial Survival Network. And welcome. You are watching, listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Well, today is August 9th, 2021, and uh, we got John Rabino with us, dollarcollapse.com. Make sure you go there, subscribe to his newsletter and his frequent updates. You don't want to miss one. Well, we're now becoming the layaway nation, layaway America. And John, like, uh, this is like a hot business that's, uh, you know, the old saying, everything that's old is new again. Yeah, you know, Carrie, I, you know, the word the world gets weirder every time you and I talk. And this is a, a perfect example of it, because basically what's happening is tech companies have revived the idea of the layaway, which is what our, our parents and grandparents used to do when they didn't have the money to buy something. They would have the store put it off to the side and then they would make payments until they were paid up and then they could take the thing home. Well, the, the new version of that is you go ahead and buy it, but the app you buy it through uh, allows you to make periodic payments until the thing is paid off, um, interest-free. So it's basically a, a version of a credit card, but for people who don't have credit cards, I guess, I don't know. It's uh, What it is though, and what it illustrates is that the, the debt slaves don't have enough ways to borrow. They need this new way to borrow. And, and the companies that are pioneering it are hot growth stocks. One of them just got bought out from some for some insane amount of money. And the others are, are like Silicon Valley darlings now, you know? So it's a, uh, it, it goes to show anything that will convince people to borrow more money from here on is a hot concept and a big innovation. And even layaways qualify. <laughs> uh, like I, they're just uh, bringing up to date a thing, something that's over a century old. I think it goes back to the late 1800s. You'd go to the general store. You couldn't afford that pickaxe. You put 50 cents down and you keep paying them 50 cents a week until you're all paid off. And then you pick up the pickaxe. And, and that's, uh, that's where we're at in America today. Uh, that's why it's the layaway nation. Well, it just boggles the mind, John, that these companies could be hot acquisition candidates. Who's buying them? Payday lenders? <laughs> Any kind of a finance company just adds that to their portfolio of, uh, of borderline cons that they're they're selling to people right now. So yeah, I think it's a, it's got a, a broad appeal within the uh, the banking sector and the financial community in general. You know, probably hey. everybody will be doing that now pretty soon. Hey, well, uh, it's just kind of funny when you you think about it. It's just like they'll probably securitize the stream of income that's coming in from the layaway plan, right? And then you'll be buying layaway bonds. Is that what's going to happen next? Of course, yeah. everything is securitized. You know, yeah. that's a given as soon as they, they ramp this thing up. But it'll, it'll be interesting because it's, it's relatively short-term paper. Mm. So um, the bonds will look a little different, but the concept will be the same. They will find a way to securitize this, don't worry. Hey, if they can securitize margarita makers like on South Park, Remember that episode where the uh, Stanley uh, gets an unlimited American Express card because everybody in South Park, their cards have been cut off by uh, the banks. So he then uh, allows everybody to go on to his credit card so that it, since he's unlimited, everyone else's credit's unlimited. And then South Park starts prospering again. But <laughs> at one point he wants his father to return the margarita maker, but his father can't because it's been securitized. And, and Stanley takes a trip up to Wall Street and it's an eye opener because if you remember, like there's a bunch of guys around a table and they have to make decisions. But the way they make decisions is they cut the head off a chicken and then wherever the chicken lands on the wheel, that's the decision they make. And that's that's how decisions get made on, on Wall Street. So anyways, just a brief digression there. But life imitating South Park yet again, you can securitize that margarita maker and keep the economy going, which is the important thing. Right, John? Um, well, in Keynesian economics, that is the, the important thing. It doesn't matter how you get your growth. As long as people are buying two or three more percent a year of stuff, 
then you're a healthy Indeed. society. It doesn't matter how much you had to borrow to make that happen. Yeah, the, uh, and as long as they buy a two or three percent more stuff that you don't need, that's the key because that's how we keep the economy going. And in the meantime, the things that are real, like gold and silver, getting totally whacked. And I don't want to sound the conspiracy theory uh, bandwagon, if you will. But uh, if I was a conspiracy theorist and I saw $4 billion worth of uh, gold contracts dumped in the access markets where no real trading takes place at four in the morning, I might get suspicious. <laughs> well, um, you know, it's, it's not a surprise that gold and silver are getting whacked, actually, because um, they've been releasing a lot of trial balloons in the last week or two from central banks uh, about maybe tightening again, because we're in danger of overheating based on some of the most recent economic data that's come out. Um, and so central banks are feeling the pressure to do something about it, because what if, um, you know, what if a three and a half percent unemployment rate causes inflation to pick up? They don't want to get there to find out. But they also um, are afraid of what the markets will do when they tighten. So they're, they're just, uh, you know, they're making really oblique references and having, you know, one guy at a time come out and say, you know, I think we should start tightening next year. We should taper by the end of the year, things like that, that, that are really mild and don't imply any kind of actual action. And, and certainly aren't you. actions in and of themselves. Yeah. But they're, they're trying to figure out what the financial markets think. And normally the financial markets just tank. You know, there's the concept of the pre-taper tantrum where the stock market tanks um, just because the Fed is talking about tightening at some indeterminate point in the future by a tiny little amount. Uh, and so they're doing that again. And gold and silver are reacting the way the financial markets tend to react to that. Uh, what's interesting is that the stock market is is down a little bit today, at least last I had looked it was, mm -hmm. but it's not crashing. So it's only gold and silver right now that are reacting to it that way. So I, we'll see if the rest of the financial markets catch up or if this is just a gold and silver specific flash crash here. But either way, I mean, th this is just background noise because in the long run, nobody can tighten ever again. You know, that's never going to happen. We will never see interest rates go up dramatically ever again. We'll never see the Fed um, cut its balance sheet by half ever again. They, they can never do that because they will tank the over leveraged financial markets everywhere in the world. Uh, so anybody who's worried about tightening's effect on their assets, like if you own gold and silver and you're afraid that um, all of a sudden monetary policy is going to tighten up, don't worry. You know, that's not going to be the thing that hurts you, if, uh, you know, because um, e it's easy money to the horizon. And that horizon is basically a cliff that we're going to fall off, you know, and at that point, all bets are off. But as long as we're heading for the cliff, but not yet going over the cliff, uh, money is going to be very easy, which is a good environment for precious metals and for other hard assets. And squiggles like the, those of the last couple of days are just buying opportunities. You know, it's a chance to grab some cheap um, mining stocks or something like that, or, or get some silver with a, a low premium. You know, that's, that's what you should be doing in the face of something like this. Um, not in any way panicking, because um, because this run has a long way to go before it ends. Yeah, and uh, we could even see it go lower than it is. It could go into the 1600s easily. Sure. Could see silver hit 22, although silver's chart looks a little better than gold. Hey, one thing I wanted to mention, and you were talking about the economy being overheated, there's 1.4 million more jobs than there are unemployed people in the country. So something has got to give. I mean, imagine that, that people would actually stay unemployed because they're getting paid to do nothing. Who would ever think that that could happen? And according to people, some people don't believe that's the case, but we know categorically now the in the Petri dish of economics, we've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt the states where they got rid of the bonus unemployment and the emergency programs have seen their job, job increases way, way higher than the states that have not gotten rid of it and are still seeing uh, high unemployment. We've seen it happen in state after state. Yeah, yeah. And it, so, so era benefits have to eventually go away. And it's the same thing with the, um, the rent and eviction moratoriums, 
where you literally don't have to pay your landlord right now if you don't want to. And, and uh, I think it's the same thing for mortgages, though I'm not sure about that. But those things eventually have to go away too. And those are, are major negatives for the economy. So that, that could be part of the, um, the, the reluctance on the part of central banks to ease or to tighten yet at all, because um, they know there are these big shocks to the system coming out um, eventually when all of these COVID benefits expire. Uh, although the government's in no hurry to do it. <laughs> you know, they, uh, Biden just extended, right? The, uh, the Illegally. Moratorium. Illegally yeah. extended because it was already shot down by the Supreme Court. Well, and yet here we are. Because it came from the CDC. Since when does the CDC have the yeah. power to stop or to tell landlords they don't have to be paid? You know, it's amazing. The, yeah. the, uh, what, what are they going to tell you that uh, you shouldn't get tips from your audience because uh, you could get uh, ill from the change? Right. Well, could it, be uh, certain uh, viruses lurking on the uh on the change that you get from the store. So they're gonna outlaw change next? Well, you know, if, if the health bureaucracy can go into the real estate market and make some gigantic change there, they can go anywhere. Yeah, so who knows, you know, don't make up any kind of crazy thing that uh, no government should ever do. And the CDC apparently now has the power to do it. Um, but still, this is all temporary. You know, these things have to eventually go away. And that's a big deal for the economy. You know, we have to, to see what happens. You know, do 10 million people lose their apartments and their houses and things? Or does nobody lose their apartments and houses because they basically saved enough money while they weren't paying rent in order to get back um, current with the rent? I don't know. We'll see. Well, uh, there's no way to know that. But I, I think people will, will have to go back to work. People who are reluctant now, who can work, but aren't for whatever reason, eventually have to do it. And um, that will make the economy grow even faster, right? More people with more disposable income working. And we, you know, we're already at extremely low unemployment, um, accelerating wage inflation, accelerating overall inflation. And you know, that's the kind of environment where normally the central bank would be tightening big time. And the fact that, um, that all they can muster right now is a couple of talking heads saying, yeah, maybe at the end of the year, maybe next year, we'll start tapering a little bit, you know, we'll scale back. And same thing with the federal government's budget, you know, the fiscal budget, we're going to run a $3 trillion deficit this year. And th there's really no end in sight to that, because we've got baby boomers retiring now, you know, and that's, that's going to be a very expensive thing when the government has to pay for our health care and our, uh, our social security going forward. So our deficits are going to get bigger. So that isn't going to go away either, you know. It, it, it's uh, it's clear that this course is the the course we're going to take until something happens to end it, you know, until we hit a brick wall or go off a cliff or whatever. And uh, you know, what what can you say? That's that's phenomenally good for real assets <laughs> that don't depend on the financial markets, but it's terrible for a lot of other investments that people think of as safe. You know, you think about how much money the government saved with the COVID killing off all the uh, old elderly, you know, lots of elderly, because it was the people 65 and over, you know, if they had said, we, div we divide in the lab in Wuhan, we, uh, and we have to be careful what we say, I'm going to have to edit out any references to certain medical conditions. But imagine if the geniuses in Wuhan said, we have to create a, 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 an ailment a uh, a sickness and we're going to call it the social security uh reduction program because that's what they did here social security and medicare because those hundreds of thousands of people who should still be around uh hanging out in nursing homes or whatever are gone and they're no longer a burden to the state so i guess the met the geniuses at wuhan really knew what they were doing john well if if you need a conspiracy theory that actually makes sense, um, it is kind of suspicious that just as we head into this massive demographic um, uh, cost period, you know, when all the old people are going to have to be paid all the stuff that they're owed, um, that a disease comes along that just kills those old people and unhealthy people who also cost society a lot of money. Um, you, know, it, you know, the timing is pretty suspicious, in my opinion. I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> and no, wonder that, this, but... no wonder those mortality predictions were so high in the beginning. You know, they were just counting the amount of money. In New York, you know, uh, the state through Medicaid pays for nursing homes. And now they got 20,000 less people, nursing homes to pay for. So it's a morbid thought, but uh, certainly one that uh, we've heard things equally as bad. Hey, so we're talking about medically necessary creeping fascism, right? Yeah. Um, you know, um, authoritarianism used to be something that had to be implemented kind of on the down low. You, you would do something, but you would give it a, a nice sounding name and, and you would make sure everybody knew it was temporary and that uh, they could count on you, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was, it was something you kind of had to uh, um, implement with some concern to people's response to it. But lately, that, that's all gone. They're just doing whatever they feel like. I, just a few examples. In, in Germany, they've made uh, demonstrations illegal now, basically. You can't just take to the streets anymore. But um, they just allowed a big one. There's a picture of it on, uh, in an article that I posted on dollarclass.com where it's, it's people to the horizon. It's, I, I don't even remember, remember what the point of the, uh, the, the get together was, but it was very popular and they allowed that to happen. But if 20 Germans wanna to get together to protest lockdowns or mandatory vaccines or anything, that's illegal. And the cops will just wade in there with, with billy clubs and tear gas. You know, there are a lot of, of pictures of, of um, you know, middle-class, kind of sort of well-dressed people out there in the streets and the cops just wailing on them in Germany. So they're, they're not taking prisoners here, you know, it's, and, and uh, they're not, there's no pretense to anything like, um, okay, they say it's about public health, but in these other places, you know, these other um, um, get togethers that are allowed to happen, same thing, but the, you know, they're, they're, anyhow, that's one thing. And uh, another one is um, there's a, a dating app for the unvaccinated <laughs> and Apple um, closed that down on their app store because they said it, uh, it didn't approach the pandemic in a serious enough way. And then let's see, last but least, what was the last one? Let me see, I've got my notes here. Oh, oh, um, somebody just lately on a, um, a Twitter and uh, other social media feed posted uh, kind of a factual account of um, Hitler, the, the 100th anniversary of Hitler taking power in Germany. That's, that's when he got elected to the head of the National Socialist Party, um, other words, in other words, the Nazi Party. And um, Instagram took that down because apparently pictures of Hitler are triggering now. So anyhow, weird stuff happening out there that are all infringements on what we used to think of as basic freedom, you know, things that could never be taken away from us. And now they're, they're finding excuses to take those things away wholesale, you know, not, not even hiding their, their motivations a lot of time, just going ahead and doing it. So things are getting scarier at an accelerating rate. And, uh, you know, what we've got to look forward to our vaccine passports and, and companies that uh, won't hire you or they'll fire you if you don't like CNN just fired three staffers because they weren't vaccinated. So, so there are a lot of things coming that um, a lot of people might define as authoritarianism that are just being implemented right now without, uh, without a lot of regard to uh, what anybody's going to do about it. Cause if, apparently they think we've got, a, they've got a so cow that, um, uh, that they can basically do this stuff without any fear of a backlash. So we'll see, you know, hopefully there is a backlash, but so far, not much in the U.S. Yeah, well, I'll believe it when I see it, but it seems like Europe, even Canada is ahead of us on the uh, rebellion against uh, restricting their freedoms for questionable uh, purposes and questionable rationale involved in it. Well, Cryptos seem like they're back in vogue, and that could be the uh, ultimate sucker rally. We'll see about that. But uh, uh, Bitcoin hit 35K, and uh, and Ethereum broke uh, 3,100. So maybe, just maybe, that's uh, what we're going to see here. Well, it, it has been a huge comeback for cryptos. Yeah, Bitcoin's up 50% from its low. And... Uh, because with cryptos, 
we don't have any way of calculating intrinsic value yet. There's no way to say whether it's undervalued or overvalued here based on the perception of the people in that market. So they could rock from here or they could go back down. You know, there's no way to know. And, and um, a lot of it has to do with the macro environment. You know, cryptos are seen as a, um, some people see them as tech stocks. So they, they buy them when they're feeling optimistic. Some people see them as a store of value, you know, digital gold, and they buy them when they're worried, um, which is, you know, kind of a nice um, feature of cryptos because that, that means that in any environment, there's an excuse for buying them. Uh, and we'll see. I mean, I, I don't have any real sense of where Bitcoin should be in another year or anything like that. But uh, the, the moves are really fascinating. You know, a tremendous amount of money is being made and lost in cryptos lately. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, there's no reason to think that that won't continue, that it won't be a really, really volatile asset class until we figure out whether governments are going to come in and just try to snuff them out or whether the, um, the broadening acceptance of cryptos in uh, corporate payment systems will make them bulletproof. You know, there'll be so many people using them that governments won't be able to do anything about them. We'll see. That's part of the, the really interesting couple of years that we have ahead of us when these new things that, uh, that are really unprecedented in human history are, are gonna happen. You know, we've never borrowed this kind of money. We've never screwed up our finances on, on a scale that we're screwing them up. Uh, we've never had digital money emerge from the private sector and challenge big fiat currencies. So all of this is, uh, is stuff that's going to work itself out over the next few years. And it's going to be a fascinating thing to watch um, if you can avoid being terrified by the other stuff that's happening. Yeah, <laughs> that's the big if, isn't it? That's the really big if. Uh, but hey, it's a brave new world that moves ahead. Speaking of technology and such, uh, SpaceX's Starlink, which is Musk's uh, uh, SpaceX company's internet service that's uh, going to be global. There's hundreds of satellites up in the atmosphere now, and that has other effects. We're not going to get into that, but uh, uh, pretty soon the speeds, they say they're rivaling uh, other, they're as good as other satellite uh, internet, if not better. And pretty soon they're going to rival standard plain old broadband yeah, uh, you know, th this is actually a much bigger deal than just, oh, you'll have another internet option out there um, because it's bringing broadband, not just, you know, crappy 25 Mbps and, you know, intermittent, which is what you get with satellites right now, um, internet um, to basically everybody. So if you're um, in a small town that doesn't have good service, you're going to get it pretty soon. If you're in a, a cabin in the woods, you're going to get it. And that's going to be a big deal demographically because all of a sudden people who can work online but, um, but have to be somewhere where they can, they can have super fast internet in order to do it, they can live anywhere. You know, So that, that means that one, first of all, places like Montana, and parts of Idaho are just gonna boom because lots of people would like to live in a place like that, but they can't work there because the internet's not fast enough. Well, it's gonna be fast enough pretty soon. So uh, that, that it's gonna be interesting to see what that means for cities, first of all, mm -hmm. because people already kind of sort of wanna move out of a lot of big cities, but uh, they have to be someplace where they can, uh, they can continue to work. And if they can live anywhere, I think the impulse to um, to get a homestead or a cabin in the woods is, is going to be very strong for a lot of people. So we're going to see a, a lot of population movements with with this technology being implemented. And um, you know they are talking about gigabit speeds ultimately with this satellite internet system. So that's that rocks. You can do any kind of video basically with gigabit speeds. You know, you can you can have a professional level podcasting set up. Very true. Um, from basically anywhere, you know, and that's that, that's going to be an interesting thing to watch happen. And I've signed up for it. So I'll, I'll keep you posted. I'll, I yeah. if any luck. I'll have it that's in a couple of months and let you know how it goes. Yeah, definitely. Give us a review, John, because, uh, you know, I'm curious about it. Um, you know, that's the whole thing with 5G, I think, is a defensive maneuver by the uh, by the telephone carriers to give you like gigabit speeds on your phone 
and thereby do away with the need for uh, cable-based broadband or or phone company-based broadband uh, because you won't need the infrastructure to uh, to actually uh, implement it because it'll be on your phone. And that's kind of what the uh, what SpaceX is offering as well. Uh, hopefully, uh, SpaceX's service is less controversial than 5G, which everybody is convinced it's going to destroy humanity. Uh, but, uh, yeah, maybe it's another plot to reduce uh, Social Security and Medicare expenditures, John. I don't know. Well, yeah, you know, that we are bathing ourselves in electromagnetic radiation. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, it's a big experiment that we're running that uh, we don't know what the long-term effects of stuff like this might be because we've never had long-term exposure before, you know? And I think um, the next couple of generations will discover whether it's a horrible thing or whether it's totally benign. And, you know, if it's, if it's a horrible thing, uh, it, it could be one of those things that you can't escape from, you know, there's nothing you can do about it after you've been exposed to something that's dangerous and causes what it's going to cause. So we'll see. I don't know. Um, that's, that's a longer term problem. And we have so many short term problems now to, to focus on and obsess over yes. that I'm going to put that one on the back burner and just worry about the other stuff we talked about today. So funny, you know, Hey, I was just th thinking like, uh, I had this really great internet service the last place I lived before I moved here. It was gigabit both directions. And the only time it slowed down was when the kids got home from school. This one here, there's no kids at school, so it never slows down. But it's a gigabit coming down. It's only 50 megabits going up. So they figure it's not as important going up as coming down that you can browse quickly. You don't need to send all that data up that quickly. I don't know what they're motivation is but i think if uh, spacex eventually gets this fast they're going to have some serious competition on their hands and then uh, and then eventually it'll all just be one company that provides internet service right because <laughs> that's the way everything works yeah, that that is yeah but uh, well you know spacex uh, doesn't necessarily have to compete with um, a city level gigabit internet to be a really successful business because there's a huge part of the population that has crappy internet right now. So if you can, uh, if you can supply just pretty good satellite broadband, uh, there's a gigantic market out there and that's just the U S you know, this is global. Um, so they're, you know, the entire developing world now is going to get fast internet. Um, so, you know, it's a big deal. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out because it's, uh, do you remember Iridium way back yeah. then? That was Motorola. That failed. That Somebody failed. Technology this. wasn't quite there yet. Yeah, yeah. So this is, yeah, this is like the next iteration of that. But this sounds like it's it's got tech that works, and uh, so it might finally fulfill the promise of Iridium from way back when. Because I remember when everybody was all pumped up about that, you know, and and it just oh. never got customers because it was too expensive. So. Yeah, totally. All right. Well, that is it for this week. Make sure you go over to dollarcollapse.com, sign up for John's newsletter, check out his latest writings, go over to financialsurvivalnetwork.com, do the same, and email us any questions for John or myself, any criticisms. We'd like to get them. The email address is kl at kerryletz.com. That's it. John, we will catch up with you again in a couple of weeks. See you, Kerry. The Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. The Financial Survival Network.